This is the Airborne Geophysics session. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Usain Lee Cooper on Airborne, Geof on Airborne Electromagnetics, so just to let you know. And we also have a lot of case studies. Today. Yeah, you have a lot of case studies too. <laughs> I suppose we can, yeah, we can start. All right, well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> everybody. Uh, thanks for attending the kickoff session here in the technical session uh, this morning. There's uh, three parallel sessions, and we're very pleased that you joined us this morning. This is the Airborne Geophysics session. I'm the, uh, if you don't know me, I'm the, I'm the chair of the session, Jean Legault. I'm with Geotech, work here in Aurora. And I'd like to introduce my co-chair, uh, Asbjorn Christensen with Nordic Geoscience, came all the way from Melbourne, Australia. And uh, he'll be co-chairing the session. Uh, this, the, we have uh, four speakers, four, four talks today, each 20, 20 minutes uh, in format, five minutes for questions and changeover. Uh, we're going to be, we're going to be, basically there'll be uh, retrospectives, future looks, present state of the art in the future of airborne geophysical methods, uh, starting with electromagnetics, uh, and then uh, uh, poten potential fields and radiometric methods. So without further ado, let's start. The uh, first speaker this morning, uh, Yusin Lee Cooper, actually is the currently, he's the lead uh, at the Airborne EM Group at Geoscience Australia. Uh, he's, uh, he had previously been a research geoscientist at uh, CSIRO in the Mineral Resor Resources Branch. His main area of research is airborne electromagnetics. Uh, he's looked at ways of interpreting and, and integrating geophysical surveys with geology, geology and data from other sources. He thinks of inversion theory and its derivations as an assessment tool for understanding EM measurements, the instrumentation and assisting interpretation Rather interesting introduction. He's used airborne EM for unveiling structures such as aquifers, uh, cover thickness, physical properties, and detection of mineral deposits. We're indeed very, I'm very pleased and, and happy that Usain uh, traveled all the way from uh, Southern Australia, Canberra, to, uh, to be with us, or is it Perth? Canberra? No, Canberra. Canberra, to be with us here today. Yeah. Without further ado, uh, Usain, he'll be, his, the title of his talk is Airborne EM, an important exploration method for revealing geological insights in the subsurface, Usain. Yeah, thank you, John. I'm gonna, I, I tend to move around, so just having this mic is sort of a little bit comfortable. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Andrea Vietzoli, who's here at the front. So well, we wrote this paper together, and um, the work uh, that are of the slides I'm gonna show comes from at least 10 years of work with AEM, and there's a lot of other people that have been involved, so just so everyone's aware. So I'll jump right into it. Um, exploring for the future and acquisition of AEM. In Australia, at least in the last decade, no real first class, what's, what's called tier one deposits have been made in the last decade. Most of our currently producing mines were discovered a few years ago, and mostly in regions where, there's, where the mineralization was quite shallow, or the host rocks were under very shallow cover. What I'm showing you there on, on the map on the left is a map from an area in the northern part of Australia, what we call the Tiza region that goes from Tennant Creek to Mount Tiza. Um, it's, it's a program uh, that is going to run for at least four years. We're in the first year of acquisition. Just to put things into perspective, on the right-hand map, I've got a map of Europe. You can see we're halfway flown uh, of this survey, and it's uh, the size of France, right? We've acquired this in just a little bit over a month, and the acquisition is at 20 kilometer spacing. It's pre-competitive data. The government, the Australian government has decided that their Borne EM is a good tool to sort of try and incentivate explorers in this part of the world. As you can see, we have diverted the paths and ranked to, to intersect boreholes according to where we have ge geophysical properties, loggings, or meteorite impacts, things that are ge of geological interest. It's um, Okay, what I'd like to talk to you about today is about AEM, of course, and how, oops, yep, 
and how AEM is being, can be used and is quite flexible, can be reprocessed and reinterpreted for uh, um, data sets that might have been originally acquired for mineral exploration, can then be reprocessed for groundwater or environmental studies and uh, vice versa. So what we say is what is, um, what is no music for some is noise for others, or what is noise for <laughs> some is music for others, right? So basically, what you have there is an old Tempest survey. In the blue, it's a slice of conductivity at a certain depth. And you can see how that dendritic pattern is actually mapping really nicely the paleo channels in the area. Then in the red, um, there was a VTEM survey targeting just the exposed rock or, or areas with, with shallow cover tailored for mineral exploration. I'll move on. Um, we had the chance, this was when I was with CSIRO, to actually fly some coincident paths. So for some of you that might not be that familiarized with AEM, we, 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 we got four different systems, a SkyTem, a Spectrum, and a Tempest, and a VTEM system to fly over the same path to try and assess the response and then to try and model and, and get the same response from, from the ground. On the left, those three, the three lines, is a typical line of interest for mineral explorers. That, where, where we have that S4, that stands for sounding four, it's a, it's a confined conductor at depth. Um, I'm just looking at here from a geophysical interest. I'm not sure if it's of mineral interest, but it, it would be definitely a target to go and be assessed by our geologists or do further geochemical testing. On the right, it's a very flat-lying line, perfect for hydrogeology, trying to find um, conductors. But really, just looking at the time, time ch channels like that doesn't really give us an, any assessment on depth or other physical properties that are of interest, right? So then we go through an inversion process, and then we derive products. On the bottom, it's after we've gone through the inversion, we've derived a map of cover thickness. The dark areas are areas where the cover is up to 80 meters thick, right? This is a really good map for our, for our guys that do the, the geochemical sampling, right? They would go and target areas of shallow cover. And then on the, on, the, on the right, those stacked profiles, those are the different systems, the SkyTem, the Spectrum, and the Tempest. And you can see how through inversion, we have recovered one same Earth with four different instruments. So that was really promising. And then we do our geological interpretation at the bottom. OK? In Australia, if you stand in most of the areas where we're prospecting, that's what you would see. There's no outcrop. We don't have the beauty of, that you guys have here in North America of being able and actually hitting the rocks. <laughs> We're undercover <laughs> um, a lot of the time. So geophysics plays a really important role, right? And, and now more and more we talk to our geologists and they, they ask for, for the geophysical interpretation. So that slice I'm showing you there is from the Tropicana deposit. It's, uh, the Tropicana is one of the big pr mine producing mines in Australia. And you can see a really nice contrast. But really, I mean, for anyone who's not related to resistivity, conductivity, that is just a nice section of warm and cold colors, right? On the, on the left, I've got an elevation. Roughly, we're, we're, we've projected it to 200 meters, and that is over. 40 kilometers, so there's quite a bit of vertical exaggeration. But really, ideally, what we want is the top section, right? This is what lets us interact with the other parts, with our geologist, with our hydrogeologist. And um, we've gone through a lot of effort to going from the bottom section to the top. Of course, you use ancillary data, you, got, you use drill holes, and then you derive a product that can let allows us to start the conversation with other um, areas of expertise. Perfect. Now, this is, looks like a bit of a cluttered slide, but, um, but I would like you to pay attention to this, because this is crucial. When we're going to go 
and do some accurate modeling and inversion, we really need the specifications, okay? So it's a, it's a table of specifications that talks about all these different properties of, of, of the systems, you know? Uh, um, the waveform, the time gates, doesn't matter really. You don't have to pay too much attention to that. What you have surrounding in the four boxes, though, is a response from a same Earth that comes from the different systems. And you can see they're not the same, right? So when we're going to transfer measured data to actually a common product, we need to have these specs right. You need to understand what your instruments are doing. OK, now I'm going to jump into the realm of, of uh, I think, what a process that's been happening, a phenomenon that we have been paying more attention to, not that it hasn't been present before, but in the last few years. And this is where Andrea has played a really important role. It's uh, on looking, we can't look at an EM response in a conventional manner anyway, anymore, sorry. It's, um, we are seeing what we think and we have built more evidence of what is a, a, an IP effect, an induced polarization effect. We are, have been used to looking at, at, at a decay just as, as a monotonic decaying curve like the first part of, 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 of the panel there on the right. And whatever, whenever we had a, a sign change, we have been treating it as noise. We, we now sort of really understand that that is not possible. We don't like even to talk about cleaning of the data. We actually have to develop, and we have developed a, model, a way of actually modeling that change in sign. Um, and it's, it's good because it's a signal when we see that change of sign, we can say, okay, there might be IP effects on our data. So this calls for the capacity of, of, of modeling with um, frequency dependent resistivity. We need to add another, param an another set of parameters in order to model these sort of responses. Okay. We're trapped. I oh, know. Here we go. Um, okay. So, what I've got there is three panels. Um, the first one is uh, just the decay that I showed you that, that that is nicely decaying, then goes negative. Reality is that if you look at this, we have been treating that change of sign as noise for a long time. So it depends where you put your noise level. If you shift your noise level. Up, then you could say, okay, I'm not going to see the IP. But also, um, it's got to do with the bandwidth of the instrument you're measuring, right? If you're not sampling enough in the time, you would, you would also not see that change of sign. Doesn't mean that the decay is not there. Doesn't mean the effect is not there. It just depends where and how you've been sampling. Um, on the right, it's also, as on the top right corner, sorry, that's a deep conductor. And that deep conductor is not allowing the K to go negative. It's got an IP effect, but it's just pushing that, that late time conductor a little bit higher, and it will not let it go negative. Now, on the bottom, if there's a decay that is negative from start. And if you don't model it, you get rid of the data. We've got maps of data where 40% of the data is negative or has some, time, some sort of IP effect and would be culled if you don't model it. 40% of the data that you pay roughly $100 line kilometer, you have to get rid of. So think about that. It's important. OK, so this is just a little um, forward model exercise. Um, the, top the top curve, you can see, is just a three-layer forward model that has no chargeability, right? It's, um, it's a conductor at depth. and what I'm trying to, to prove here, especially for the mineral exploration thing, um, um, gang, <laughs> is that if you have a conductor at depth with a little bit of um, chargeability on the surface, it would be masked. And I want to try and prove that. And then we're going to show you some data that actually where that happens. So the only difference between those two curves you see on the right panel, it's a three-layer simple model. The only difference is. The one that goes negative, positive, negative, positive, 
has a 300 microvolt, mi yeah, mi millivolt volt chargeability on the near surface, which is not that much, actually, right? It's a shallow, uh, it's, we've just assigned a chargeability on the top surface, and you can see that will mask your conductor at depth. Um, so I'll show you an example on real data. So why bother doing an IP? Um, the top line is just being inverted. It's a conductivity section that has been inverted using no, not considering the IP. So there's no AI, no, and and it's AIP for airborne IP. On the top on the top panel, there's no IP considered, and you can say there are those red conductors at depth could be and have been in the past flagged as false positives, right? You see an AM section, you see a nice conductor at depth, you say, okay, confined, confined conductor, potential mineralization. The bottom line has been corrected from IP. And then I want to draw your attention to two things. One, we have a resistivity section now, and we have a chargeability section, which is the bottom one, right? So you can see those conductors are actually continuous. They're not, they're not broken, right? They're a, and, and have later been identified as, as shales. So you recover a more credible resistivity section with the other added parameter, which is chargeability. On the left there, there's a decay where we have actually fitted the data, which is also very important, <laughs> crucial. That's our first stage. If you can't fit the data, forget about it. Okay, yes, five minutes. Okay, I'll go really, uh, I'll, I'll finish. Um, so here we've just got a, a drill hole where there's mineralization at depth. And um, we've got a conductivity section in the middle and also a resistivity downhole, right? So our area of interest is the Barney Creek formation and we flow some airborne EM over it, of course. What I've got here is why bother with the AIP? It's because we've actually recovered the mineralization. So whoever says, well, this hasn't been tested. Yes, it has. There is a drill. That's only the resistivity. It's not the chargeability, right? But we've also done this with a 1D, 2D, and 3D without chargeability, without modeling the IP. And this is a 2.5D. It fails blatantly to, to recover the sulfide body. Okay, right, just very quick, I'm gonna go to show what we have been doing in the last two or three years, going from a stochastic or statistically um, inversion and sort of a little bit of the differences from a deterministic. This is a section of a frequency domain system that was flown in Timor-Leste for groundwater. What I've showed you there is a UBC 1D 25 layer EM flow, a GA light, different products. It's just a section. The problem we always face in geophysics when we do inversion or transforms is which one is correct, which one is right. We don't know, right? It could always all be right. So just very briefly, the difference between stochastic methods and deterministic methods is one looks for a best single model, whilst other samples a, a, a much broader space of models, and then you create statistics with that. These are common products. This is some work I did with Burke Minsley from the USGS. Um, common products just gives you statistics, it gives you a distribution. Here on the bottom panel, the, sh the, the dark shading is areas where more credible, there's more probability that the resistivity exists. And I'll try just go for an example. We have put two soundings there. That's a section in, in the Baukau limestone. So the beauty of this section, as opposed to the others, is it was, um, sam we have sampled 100,000 models at each sounding, and we have 500 locations. So this section is, this figure is built by 50 million models, right? So the only thing that gives us is robust statistics. We've sampled the model space quite broadly, and we can now start talking about probability, yeah? The confidence we have on our model. 
right? So you can see that the bottom one is a deterministic, the other one is uh, stochastic, quite similar, right? But as I mentioned, the top one gives us some feel, some, some part of statistics. And then we can start doing clays, resistivities. So very, very quick, I'm two slides away. Um, when we have statistics, when you build, you can actually start sampling your, your model and say, dividing the domain. So we're gonna go from resistivity to lithology, which is really important, right? So you, you overlap your probability distribution over whatever you have determined your real conductivities are, and then you try to extract lithology. What you get, really, is now we're, we're, we're mapping the most probably the lithology at different depths. And on the right, you can see a section where the yellow colors are areas where the intermediate clays or the resistive limestone is most probable to be, right? So it's how we have gone from values of resistivity to lithology. So just the take home messages. We can no longer look at the AM decays as monotonically decaying curves. There are more IP effects in the AM data than you think. Not if you, just because you don't see a change in sign doesn't mean there's no IP. Remember, all models are wrong, but some are really incredibly useful, right? So use the ones that are useful. Um, use your ancillary data to give your geophysical models geological content. The stochastic methods enable a robust link between model resistivity and lithology. And don't get lost in the confusing cacophony of the regolith cover. Further exploration success requires expansions of, of search and discovery spaces to areas that are under cover. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Usain, for that whirlwind tour. Actually, we have perhaps time for one question. Any question? Well, you come all the way from Canberra. In, 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 in your opinion, I noticed that you didn't talk about two-dimensional or three-dimensional inversion. Do you want to, do you have any comments or insights from the um, Australian perspective or your perspective on, say, yeah. 3D inversion? of EM data? Um, I'm still getting my head around 1D personally. I'm not, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very complex. I mean, the problem is already extremely non-unique, right? The EM is a really non-unique problem. So, of course, 3D is good. The world is 3D. My world currently with 20 kilometer spacings is 2D <laughs> on the AM side of things in the exploring for the future. I, I just, um, I personally like sounding by sounding. It's a way of assessing individual soundings. And I think 3 and 2D products are very nice. I, I like them, but I think that's a, a second, third, or even fourth stage after you've assessed the data and understood exactly what's happening there. Thank yep. you. Right. Excellent. Thank you. That's what's, thank you very much. That's all for Thank you, Sam, for his long travel and for 20-minute talk. Thank you.